so everyone talk about microservices. They say how great they are, but they don't say how bad they are or they just bash them because for some reason they assume that they are just bad. So there's a subtitle, think for yourself, and that's the important part. Out of the technical things, it won't be just a rant, it will be rant about modularity, about a thing that we discovered a couple of decades ago and was long forgotten. forgotten. So first thing first, rules. If you got any questions, ask them right away. There is supposed to be some kind of an application where I can uh, see questions later on. I'm not sure if I will, so just raise your hand and uh, just stop me if you want to ask about anything. And although I don't like it, let me talk about a bit my, uh, about myself. So you read from my bio that I'm a Java guy, so this will be a Java talk. I was there for some time in the Java space. Uh, however, what I didn't write down in my bio is that I'm recruiting a lot. I'm a three city jug leader. I'm working with a client, the technical client and his developers. I'm working with my team. I conduct one on ones, talk with them a lot. All of that boils down to one thing. I work with people. I get feedback from many, many sources and I hear microservices everywhere, everywhere. I go to conferences, there are microservices. I open my fridge, there is a microservice internet of things in JavaScript. So after some time, although I'm a big fan of microservices or microservice way, and I see a lot of value in it, uh, I'm just sick that you do microservice everything like everything, because it makes no sense. There is a good usage of it, and I want to think about with you about where is the space for microservices? What are the downsides of those? And what are the advantages? And are there any other options? And why we want to do them? So let's look at a piece of code. It should be rather standard. It shouldn't be considered really bad. It shouldn't be considered good. But it's something that anyone will understand. Is that code simple? Is that a good design? Is that even a design? How it will behave? Can you predict the output? Assuming that everything will go as the, the names of the functions says. It's, it should be rather trivial, right? And that code will go on a journey with us. We'll see where we will end. From my perspective, when I look at it right now, it looks simple. It's just four lines of code. But first thing first, let's talk about modularity. What it is. What is the definition? And I'm using Wiki. Why? Because Wiki is created by a lot of people, and if I agree with something, I try to use it. And I agree with, with this definition. And it's really simple, and I like simple things. So modularity by Wiki is uh, a degree uh, of how components work together. And there are some components, there are some scales, because there is a degree and there is ability to separate them and recombine them. So there are three points which really define modularity. They say, is the modularity high or low? So you can start scaling how modular your system is. And please bear with me for some time. Let's go through all of the basics, real basics, because I think that it's important that we are on the same page. So out of those rules, you can see that they really apply well to something that we call solid, five principles. Uh, each one of them really talks about how modular your system is, not only, but they really apply to it. If you got a lot of modules, you got the single responsibility, because it's hard to create a lot of modules that do everything. If you, want to, if you want to be high on a scale, then most likely they need to be open for modification. You, they need to be interchangeable. Uh, you got some interfaces because you need to define them somehow. So all of those rules, and most likely you inject them because that's, that's where you get in the end. And solid rules uh, is fundamental for everyone that believes in Uncle Bob and a couple other people. And most of us will just agree that they are a good rules. Second term is coupling and cohesion. Uh, those two simple rules are also quite well known. 
you should decouple the system uh, and create a high cohesion between the components. So similar things go together, but they are really distinct from the things that uh, are different. Very, very simple. And from that, we can pull out a very simple so, uh, fact that highly modular system is a system that is well designed and most likely easy to maintain. And that is the, for me, really important part uh, of building a software system. Why? Because you are building system not for today, not for two months from now on. You're not building only greenfield systems, but you build systems that will run for many, many years. Uh, I was just on a TED New York uh, talk, and he was talking about it. He was talking about COBOL developers that were maintaining the systems for 50 years, five decades and longer. And their systems are still in production. Uh, personally, I know systems that I wrote that are still in production after five years. It's not so great, but it's still good, because they are bringing value. And I'm not the man in the middle of everything, although in here, in the spotlight, I feel a bit. Uh, however, my system is changing someone's life. It creates a revenue, it creates a job. So, the modular system, why we, why we treat it as a good thing? Because it's testable, because we got a lot of small things that are interchangeable. Because it has a good design, because you can change the components. It, uh, ends up in components and maybe libraries, something that you can reuse, something that we pursued for many, many years. And it's really a holy grail of software development. They are easy to scale, because if you got things that work in separation in small scale, then most likely you can just add a bunch of them and scale up. And they are microservice ready. And yes, I treat it uh, as a something good, because I really don't want to bash on microservices. However, still, if it is so good, then everyone will use it, right? <laughs> of course not. Uh, the issue is that from the history, we know that modularity is with us for over 40 years, uh, or 50 years even. It started in June in one of the summits, uh, Academia Things, where the guys were just talking how great it would be to have modularity in the systems. And later on, we got the OO languages, the functional languages, all of the kind of the extensions to existing languages for the modularity. And guess what? We got Java for over 20 years. We were celebrating like two months ago, 20 years of Java. And still, we cannot really achieve high modularity. We invented SOA. Right now, we are inventing microservices. And all of that was there. All of that was there in two types, in two flavors of it. First one is class time, uh, compile time modularity. For that, you use some language features like classes and packages, something that everyone knows, that, that is being taught at any kind of a university. Even if you go to some private school that just sells the certificates, they will tell you that there are classes and packages. And with that, you can start to modularize. You can create modular systems. It's hard because it's not a strength constraint. It's not so rigorous about the design. However, you can apply rules. Jakub Naberdalik, one of the Polish speakers, one of the persons involved in creating this conference, he taught me a rule that he is following, that each package can, has, uh, can have at most one public class and up to 10 classes uh, at most. So it's quite hard, but if you will think about it, 10 classes, it's not a lot. And most likely, it's really decoupled from everything else. And it's very highly cohesive, because you put only things that are, are going well together into one package. Then he creates sub-packages which follow the same rule, but that's a bit different story. OK. so. Very basics. You can modularize your code. Later on, you can create modules using standard build tools. All of us knows that. It's a bread and butter of uh, everyday work. However, still, I don't know how your project's going, but right now I'm seeing a project where we pulled out out of the single code base 130 modules, 
and we are still going. We still got a lot of GAT classes, which prevents us from taking even more out. So not everyone are aware of it. Then we go to libraries. So you got the highest level of the compile time modularity. You just created a class, a set of classes packaged in a jar, let's say, that can work anywhere. And it's quite good because there are some drawbacks. However, you just build it once and you can run it anywhere in any conditions. At least that's the, what Java says. Uh, it's easy to configure because there shouldn't be that many switches. However, there is dependency hell for us because if you're using Maven, then you know that in any long living system, you will find a lot of issues. So this is not the final solution, most likely. With that, we are heading to this other flavor of modularity, which will be runtime modularity. It's the same thing, but you don't have to rebuild the whole system after even the smallest change. Uh, so you're just going on live, and while going 100 miles per hour, you just push a new commit or push a new jar somewhere, and it starts up. It's great, because you can go fast. You don't need JRebel for that, for example. Uh, however, it comes with a set uh, of problems on its own, like, for example, how do you configure that, how you track what you're running, which version of a jar you have. Is your array list the same array list in module A and module B? Because maybe you compile that with a different set of Java target or different Guava version or something. You got a lot of answers that you need to cover, and you got one tool that supports it out of the box, which is OSGI. The rest you have to build on your own. At least I'm not aware of any other quite decent and big tool. So with that, we are coming back to our code. It's still simple. It didn't change. I just copy-pasted that slide a couple of times, so we'll see it again. Don't worry. Uh, but if you will start thinking about it, where are those services coming from? Because if you will check them in the code, maybe they're just interface, but where are the implementations coming from? Does this simple four lines of code is really doing what you're thinking that it's doing? Is it asynchronous? Is it synchronous? How it's working? Let's think about it even more with microservices. Microservices, by definition, created by Martin Fowler and James Lewis, two I consider fathers of microservices. It's, it's quite long. It's not as long as they put it on the website. I just took part of it. We heard about microservices so many times that I'm not willing to repeat it. However, I want to focus on a couple of things, on the distributed part, on the poly-language, poly-storage, poly-something, about the deployment that you create as services that are deployed in a single go without any thinking. Maybe about many versions of a thing running right away uh, in the same time. So you got version N, A and version B. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. It allows you to go fast, really fast, because you just take a development team and say to them, OK, this is the part of the work I want you to do, and they work in isolation. They don't depend on anyone. It's great. It's easily scalable, because you just take one module and run it 10 times. Uh, with that, it's easy to achieve 99% of being up and alive, because if one service goes down, you got 10 others, so that's not a problem. It's modular, by definition, because you run and develop that in separation, so you just get it. There is no magic in it, because it just runs. It's super easy to deploy it because it's a small app. And most likely, it has its own container. You just turn it on and it goes. Brilliant. You don't need JBoss or any other rubbish stuff. It's easy to test a single module, right? Because it's like, let's say, 10 classes, 20 classes. It's sitting in James Lewis' head, so it's not so big, uh, although he's a very smart guy. Um, and it's easy to maintain a single module, because as many people will tell you, they just delete the module and write it again, because it's small. It sounds great, right? If you would get an advertisement like that in TV, you wouldn't believe it. But if you will come to the software conference, it suddenly sounds like it's true. 
And yeah, there are some drawbacks. Because I could really show you the previous list and just talk about it. Because basically, if you got all of those things, they are not coming out of the box. There is no single framework that will provide you HA or that will provide scalability. You have to build it in. You have to decide how do you go about the service that it will scale and work well with the other services. How do you will support sharing of the data between the services, because most likely you will have to do it. How do you do transactions if you have a logistic system that needs to support it? And migrating to NoSQL is not an answer. There is a lot of issues. Most, of, most likely, the one that will get to you fastest is how do you do operations? How do you tell your administrators that there is not a one application, but hundreds of them? They will be, it's, it's offensive because they will be angry at you because you just threw your problem on the other side of the fence and said to them, okay, have fun. And out of the whole list of many, many things of this being distributed, which brings a lot of problems on its own and other things, my question to you or to the people that are not in this room, but I hope that you will speak with them, is why do you want to go microservice way? Are you really guardian or do you have CMS? If you're writing 10 articles, you don't need to be on 100 servers. Maybe you got movies on your site, but you most likely link them to YouTube. It's not being Netflix responsible for 30% of a movement. Maybe you got a shop, but you didn't have to invite a cloud to sustain your business, because without it you would go down. Come on. I know that those are the really bright examples of microservices. However, most likely, your company is not one of those companies. They had an issue. They had a very specific issue. They went beyond any kind of a framework that is out there. They had to invite something on their own. And it sounds cool that you can do it, but you shouldn't. Think about it. If after 10 years you will come back to your project, what will you see? If you will decide, yeah, I will write that one module in Go, second one in Kotlin, third one in Ceylon, one in Java, because Java, well, it's Java. Uh, let's use it. And then you will start to work on them with different frameworks. How many te different technologies will you find in the end inside? And then you will tell all other teams, go and do the sa same. How many of them will be rigorous enough to create something that's responsible and, long, in the long run, sustainable. Um, my current project, uh, each year someone decided to add a new library, and I'm happy that they built a monolith. Why? Because at least I got one big ball of mud, not hundreds of them. So, sorry. Luckily for us, we started to work on microservices. Uh, it's, it's quite fresh still. But we started to categorize them. We started to build tools around it. And I took all of the examples from Aaron Gupta. However, more people started to think about how to create different types of microservices, how to lay them out to respond to the business. Because someone thought that it's not really a good idea to just say that there is hundreds of applications and they communicate in some way. So we created to start, uh, so we started to create patterns like aggregator pattern or proxy pattern. Those are really simple. There is a service that calls other services. There is also a chain, so we got a real a sequence of the calls. We got branching where one service calls another, which may call different ones. There is also shared data. We started to couple them. We started to say, yeah, it's not really that we can uh, divide them in different databases, data sets. We ought to use one database. Why? Because we have it. We have to live with it. We have the same data schema or whatever. We started to think about how we go asynchronous, because we want to scale up. And being asynchronous helps greatly to that. And all of it, really, is something that we discovered many, many years ago with SOA. We called it integration patterns. Uh, if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. I had to go through it a couple of years ago when I started my, one of my recent pro 
one of my last projects uh, before changing the company uh, and discover all of those great things. So our microservices are the new SOA. Uh, well, according, I, I'm not the first person that thought about it. When I was Googling, it turns out that even uh, Martin Fowler thought about it. And the r only real difference that, at least from what, they wrote, from what he wrote with some other folks I discovered, is that SOA is the microservice, but done the right way. I won't be arguing with it, because it really is. <laughs> There's no difference between SOA and microservice, other than don't, we didn't propose yet to use enterprise service bus. Um, so, let's think about the code for one more moment. What will happen if we will lay out our services in a different way? What will happen if we are going to change the implementation? It's really simple code, but you can, after thinking about all of those patterns, uh, you can really start laying the sequence of what will happen in a different way. Maybe it will be blocking, maybe it will go asynchronous, maybe the results will be unknown to us. Maybe you have to start designing things from ground up to think about the failure in one of those Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So, uh, I think that Simon Brown said that what makes you think that you can write a microservice application if you can't write a monolith? Because monoliths are, uh, that's recorded, that's sad, but monoliths are really simple. It's a one application standing somewhere and maybe there's a load balancer when you want to have two of them. And that's it, really. Microservices, there's a hundred of applications somewhere running something with some protocol between them. I don't know how many of you, quick show of hands, wrote a protocol ever. Two hands. Good for everyone else. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So if you cannot really sustain an application, how do you do with a protocol? that is being shared between hundreds of applications in different versions? How do you ensure that it's backward compatible? One of the runs that I hear very, very often on the recruitments, on the technical interviews, is that uh, I ask question, what would you change in Java if you could change anything? And a lot of people say, I would throw out backward compatibility. So we hate it. And still, we need to start thinking about it. Because if we want, then how do we want to scale up with hundreds of services that are decoupled by the definition? How do you want to deploy a single service on one server without redeploying all of the others if you change the protocol? How do you do it without the shared libraries? How do you do it with that without the compilation time safety uh, that comes out from Java when you have some shared Maven module? So let's go to OSGI. OSGI is quite quite interesting one uh, technology standard because really it's a specification. I did it once, uh, and after that on a long-running project, and after that I said to everyone, okay, you have to do OSGI at least once uh, because the first project dies, and then you start to understand it. So OSGI is a set of modules, which are called bundles, which are coming from different projects, laid on top of the whole infrastructure. That provides you some services, that provides some security, and all of the layer above the JVM. You don't get the direct access to the JVM. There's uh, some hacks on class loaders, which allows you to be runtime modular, because you can just on the run exchange bundles. Um, it comes with its own kind of a POM file, which is manifest, the old good manifest that you put in the uh, meta-inf catalog, which says which version you're running, what's your name, how do you identify the thing, all of the metadata, what are the exposed packages, the packages that will be available to the others, so you won't create leaky abstractions that somehow see someone sees your classes. You define 
what someone sees. You define what you export. You define what you import. Suddenly, you don't have a problem with all of the library hell that someone is using, uh, I don't know, Apache Commons 2.4 and someone else is using 3.0 or some Xerxes uh, serialization suddenly fails on one of the services. It's all gone because you got this and you got the layer of OSGI that provides the compatibility between the packages. You got the whole life cycle of bundles. Uh, it is well defined what will happen if a bundle, which you can call a service, which you can call a module, will disappear. Suddenly, something that you're depending on disappears, what's happening? OSGI tells you what will happen. And it may trigger a lot of actions. So a lot of things may happen. You get it all of that out of the box. There are a couple of implementations of the specification out of different vendors. They are in open space, uh, open source space. They are from vendors that require you paying. So anyone will find anything that's interesting for him. However, if it's so great, why not all of the applications are written in it? And it's because it's hard. It has all of the traits of microservices. If you will think about it, from the day one, it will require out of you to think about how to fail, how to fail safely, because one of the modules may disappear. It tells you, you will tell me how to do it. What should I do when a bundle that I'm depending on disappears? It will ask you how you should start up. What are, sorry, your dependencies? How do you should act in many, many different scenarios? From the day one, you have to discover that. You have to pre prepare for the failure. You have to design the system, which is hard, which microservices doesn't really put on you. You can just write microservices out of the box. It has high learning curve, because there's a lot of uh, new stuff in it. There's a lot of new services. There's a new way of doing things, although it's a plain Java. Uh, and it's hard. It's hard because if someone calls you at 1 a.m., and ask you why the class was not found in the code base where it is, it's really hard to tell and reason about it because it makes no sense in most cases. So there's a lot of things that you have to relearn. For example, how to use logging. And I'm not kidding you. It took us, I think, two weeks before we were ready to do logging and we read a bunch of articles. Still, it's great. Why? Because it provides you modularity out of the box. It makes you think about all of those things. So if you do uh, microservice design using OSGI, it will tell you what you have to think about. It will ensure that all of the developers that are working on something really, really apply the same rules, very strict rules. It covers all of it, uh, all of the aspects, and it's a standard which came out of the big companies and it's on the market since 1998, I believe. I may be wrong about it, but and it's still a pure Java. There's not a ma much of a magic, however, there's a sum. So you may be wondering, is that all? Do we have OSGI, Maven, Gradle, and that's it? No, of course not. You can design your own system. Uh, you can use anything that you want. Like, for example, I'll be talking about it more when I will be presenting Nashorn. However, quick rant about the system that we wrote. Because three years ago, I believe that it was more or less so. In this conference room, maybe not exactly this one, but on 33rd degree, I heard about the concept of microservices. It was great. I really, really stand after it, because SOA just went somewhere. I didn't understand why. And I really believe that having the well-designed modules is important. So I started the design system that really apply all of those rules. So we build uh, an application that control buildings like this building inside of the OSGI container the big blue box with smaller boxes which were connected through the event bus. We were just publishing events. So 
we didn't know what will happen, what, who will receive the message, what the message will be, what will be the format, how it will be interpreted. It was working for us. Uh, we use the standard bus that's in the OSGI, because OSGI provides you a standard way of how the bundles will all interact. We added a camel to that in one of the other systems, because we had more of those. We added a persistent queue even for that, because we needed that. We started to build all of the things from the ground. It was hard. It took us a lot of time and many senior developers that put a foot in, into it. Inside, we, in, I think that of three bundles, we had a whole slew of microservices on our own created in Nashorn uh, or at Trino at the very, very beginning. So there was an event loop with another queue and we started to synchronize through the queues. And suddenly we had a lot of small scripts written in Nashorn that were in JavaScript, really, that were responding to some events, that were interacting somehow. But we had to design all of that on our own. We had to think about the threads. That is something that will come to you at some point of time while you're doing microservices. Because you have to think, how do you share data? How do you synchronize between different applications? What will happen if one system will roll back? Should I do something on the other end? How will I do it? What are your answers to that? Because, uh, as I mentioned on the very beginning, I have no answers in here. This is the talk that's like Hadi talk. It's more about thinking about things, not answering them. Because I really believe what he said, that there is no silver bullet. And let's look at this code once again. How simple it is. Four lines of code, which may be asynchronous, which may be running JavaScript underneath, Maybe they are using Erlang somewhere. Maybe someone heard that the Go is a new cool thing. Maybe they open a socket and just call somewhere. And maybe that will change one day, because you build a modular system, most likely with dependency injection. And it's easy to change components then. So in the end, and I'm not ending, um, everything is about the design. Because you know what are your requirements. It's a long lost art of designing the system, of thinking about the modules, of thinking about the units of, that are going to do some work, about classes, about packages. We just crank out code and we are happy that we do it in a new framework and later on we just abandon it. However, do you use design patterns? I ask about design patterns on the interview and guess what, people know too, not all of them even. Singleton and factory. Most of them cannot even tell you why the singleton is bad, and the rest will tell you what the factor is, but they will be wrong about it. So have you learned about the very bread and butter of our, mm, of our job, of our responsibility to be, a, to be a professional? Have you learned the design patterns? Have you learned how to refactor? And if yes, have you learned all of your colleagues about it. Because it's great that you do it, but we're not alone. And not everyone understands that the system on the left is worse than the system on the right, although they are perfectly the same system. But it's easier to read the one on the, sorry, uh, for you it will be on the right. So the one that's being separated, it's considered to be better. Once again, a very simple code. So many options in here. Three lines of code, uh, maybe four even, if you will consider how it may work underneath the creation of a new object. So many options, so many questions, which no one never asks. Um, so to summarize all of it, because let's get starting go till to the end. We have some school of thinking about the code that has been raised four decades ago, over four decades ago. It was called modularity. We started to work uh, around it. We created languages around it. We created uh, solutions around it. It's the modularity itself may be a goal, 
Microservices are not. Microservice is just a way of doing things. It allows you to achieve high modularity, but it's not given out of the box. It's not something that will just appear. It won't solve your problems. It's not a silver bullet. It will just make you think about things after you will start implementing them. Unless you're one of the people that really knows what they are doing and you started to think about it earlier. However, funny fact, uh, I I'm offline for almost three weeks because I'm renovating my house and I'm living in the countryside for the last three weeks. And yesterday, while looking at the slides, I checked online what was happening on Twitter, and one of the first tweets was linked on the Martin Fowler page, where he said that maybe we should start writing monoliths again. It was about three weeks ago when he wrote it, so I missed it. And he proposes that maybe we should start from monolith and start pulling out microservices. Why? Because from what they observed at Thoughtworks, uh, many teams started to build microservices and failed because it's hard. When you don't know your domain, when you haven't designed it appropriately, and domain-driven design is still a black magic for most of the people, it's not something that everyone heard. It's not something that everyone did. So if you haven't done it properly, if you didn't write the proper monolith that it's easy to extract microservices out of it, and it's easy to fail for you, because you don't understand all of the boundaries of the objects, of the services, of how they should interact. You're losing all of it. So he proposes that let's start from the monolith and start pulling out. There are some successful teams. They did it. They did it at really big companies, like Netflix, like Amazon. However, you most likely don't want to do it. Like, for example, LinkedIn wrote their own web framework. Why? Because they had to. Because there was not nothing on the market that was able to sustain the movement on the page that they had. Not all of us has the same problem. Think. Think every moment. And despite that you think, because you are willing to invest your time to come to the conference, the rest of your team, no, that's not true for everyone, but the rest of your team is sitting right now at their day job and they are creating a new microservice or a set of them or something that they are calling a microservice. They are not thinking about it, maybe. Maybe they are. Sorry for all of those folks that are thinking about it. So start talking with people. What problem do we have? What problem do we st try to figure out? What problem do we want to solve? Because there is that thing that everyone pursues in this, um, in our profession, which is called, we want to be architects, we want to be senior developers. And people with a year or two years of experience come to me for the technical interview and they say that they want a uh, senior developer position. Why? Because someone else on the market will give it to them. Because we are prima donnas of 21st century, as Hari said two years ago. We can. We really can influence the market because there is a high demand for us. I'm coming out of the economy uh, school and uh, I'm, I was highly interested in that. So I'm looking at things like a market and as a project. And I try to combine those two things. So yes, you can influence how the company will work. But real seniority will come when one day you will say, I don't want to do microservices because it's not a good way for this small system. I want to do a monolith. I maybe want to do it in struts and struts one. Why? I don't know, maybe. Maybe for some reason. Maybe I want to do it in COBOL or, God, God forbid me, but in Perl. For some reason, the Perl is the perfect solution. And despite that I hate it, I'm willing to do it. Why? Because I'm solving someone's problem. I'm mature enough to do it. That is the day when you discover, great, I'm a senior. I'm a real senior, not just a guy that is being paid more. 
And I'm willing to tell that to the others. I'm willing to go and explain, because I did the basic lessons. For example, right now, uh, I'm finishing reading, rereading, again, Mythical Man Month. And I said to myself, every 10 years, I will read that book. Why? It's so old. It's so not up to the today's standards. It's not about the agile change that we had created. But still, I want to remember where we are coming from, why we are using the solution. I want to understand it so I can apply it properly. So if you want to be a senior developer, and if you want to have senior developers, not the tenured one in your company, go out and evangelize. Go out and tell them that they should learn the basics. And with that, if you got any questions or want to send me feedback, then shoot. Thank you.